Hi everyone and a very good evening to you all. Welcome to tonight's Skeptics in the Pub online. I'm Cleo from Winchester Skeptics and I'll be your host for the evening. We had hoped that our, our Glaswegian Brian would be able to host today but some family commitments for him means that I've got the pleasure of being here again today. I'll try not to disappoint. So Skeptics in the Pub online started because of the lockdown when we could no longer hold our meetings in person. Um, we're a collaboration of people from these groups around the country, and we're really proud of our eclectic mix of speakers. But the thing they all have in common, whatever their subject, is that they approach their topics from a rational, evidence-based point of view. Our speaker tonight is Deborah Hyde, who will be talking to us about the Cumbrian vampire of Croglin Grange. Was it truly a vampire? I like to think so, but I fear Deborah may be here to shed some reason on the subject. We'll see. So her talk will last about 45 to 60 minutes, then we'll have a 15 minute break followed by a Q&A. If you want to ask a question, go to the link, which is just below, where you can raise one. The other link just below me here will take you to where you can donate to help with our running costs. Our mods will post other links in the chat from time to time, such as how to buy our stylish sceptical apparel, and we also have mugs and face masks, and where to find out more about our speaker. For any of you who've got hearing difficulties uh, or would like to see it, what I'm saying or what Deborah's saying written down, we now have closed captions available. Just choose the small CC at the bottom of the screen. So Deborah Hyde is our speaker today. Deborah Hyde is described by Wikipedia as a British skeptic, folklorist and cultural anthropologist. She's a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and she was editor-in-chief of The Skeptic magazine until last year when she handed the baton over to Merseyside Skeptics. Deborah writes and lectures extensively about superstition, cryptozoology, religion and belief in the paranormal, with special regard to the folklore and the psychology and sociology behind these phenomena. This isn't the first time she's been introduced as a vampire expert. And in Deborah's other life, she's involved in film, makeup, prosthetics and creature effects, and she's also been on the other side of the camera. Fittingly enough, given her interests, she was the corpse bride in the Brothers Grimm. So it's now time to give Deborah a very warm sitpo welcome for her talk, The Vampire of Croglin Grange. Over to you, Deborah. Good evening, everybody. Really lovely to be here. Um, this is a very interesting case because that many vampires in this country. Obviously, I'll, I'll skip over the introduction to me because Cleo did a very able job there. But you can see there's uh, the Instagram ID and the Twitter ID. I spend most of my time on Twitter, I suppose. So if you want to follow me there, please do. Here's also just an illustration of the skeptic. This is normally when somebody hasn't done the in, um, introduction for me. This is a map of Croglin. Now, Croglin is a village in Cumbria. It's actually sort of halfway between a village and a hamlet. It's a very small um, sort of group of houses. And it comes from um, the, the Middle English word croc, which means a bend. And the probably, um, probably Scandinavian sort of origin word lin, which means torrent or a river. So it's from a bend in the river and that's that's where it is. It's been there for a very long time. It's a very long established village and parish. Um, here we have an illustration, the illustration that's usually used for the vampire of Croglin Grange. And I mention it because I think it's I kind of think it gets the quintessence of it. It gets the scenario, as you'll see, that we describe later. And it was done by an artist named Les Edwards. There was going to be a Beast of Croglin Grange or Vampire of Croglin Grange book, and it was never used. Fortunately, it did see the light of day for two other collections, which, um, which is very good. Les Edwards was a very prolific artist, commercial artist around that time, and I, I think he's done a really brilliant job here. Uh, nobody really knows knows who he used as a model for this. Um, it, it's been a sort of source of, of interest, a bit of puzzlement ever since. Basically, the story comes from a man named Augustus Hare. And Augustus Hare was a person who was a sort of, well, he just went round eating dinner at other people's houses uh, for his lifetime. He was an English writer, raconteur, and he wrote prolifically. He wrote a book about his memoirs. Um, and generally, the, the stories fell into one of two camps. The first was that he wrote about a lot of aristocrats and posh people who he dined with. 
And the other one was um, descriptive historical accounts and cities. But he also included a lot of folklore, including a very classic black dog story. Um, a reviewer in the New York Times said once, um, Mr. Hare's ghosts are rather more interesting than his lords or middle class people. So it's the ghosts that we're going to concentrate on this evening. Augustus Hare went to dinner one evening with uh, Henry Liddell, who was Earl Ravensworth. You can see a picture of him in the middle. That's Augustus Hare to the left. And um, uh, Lord Ravensworth looks like he's got a beard comprised mainly of Muppet fur. I would guess that's what it looks like to me. And his intended son-in-law was also there. He was a man named Captain Edward Fisher Rowe, and he was Liddell's um, sorry, Ravensworth's neighbour in Surrey. He was just about to marry his daughter. Now, what happened was that um, Fisher Row Hare says did have a place uh, called Croglin Grange. He said when, in a lapse of years, the Fishers outgrew Croglin Grange in family and fortune, they were wise enough not to destroy the long-standing characteristic of the place by adding another story to the house. But they went away to the south and let Croglin Grange out. So in search of the bright lights and the fancy London kind of culture, they moved to Guildford. And uh, mind you, I can't really criticise it because apparently there's quite a good Pizza Express at Woking. Um, and that is where Augustus Hare found them. Now, the story as he tells it is that the Fisher family have possessed a very curious old place, Croglin Grange. It's one story high, it, but it has a terrace from which large grounds sweep away towards the church in the hollow and a fine distant view. So very specific kind of a description of the environment. Their tenants, two brothers and a sister, they heard their praises from all quarters. The tenants were greatly delighted with their new residence and in every respect, Croglin Grange was exactly suited to them. So he was in the Pizza Express in Woking and they were quite happy up in Cumbria. They all separated for the night, all retiring to their rooms on the ground floor, and the sister didn't close the shutters. It had been a very hot day. And gradually she became aware of two lights which flickered in and out of the belt of trees, which separated the lawn from the churchyard. Fixed in a dark substance, a definite ghastly something, increasing in size and substance as it approached. The most uncontrollable horror seized her. Well, it would. The door was close to the window and the door was locked on the inside. And while she was unlocking, it, she must seem, she must for an instant be nearer to it. Her voice seemed paralysed, her tongue glued to the roof of her mouth. She heard scratch, scratch, scratch upon the window and saw a hideous brown face with flaming eyes glaring in at her. She became aware that the creature was unpicking the lead. A diamond pane of glass fell into the room. Then a long bony finger of the creature came in and turned the handle of the window and the window opened. It came up to the bed, twisted its long bony fingers into her hair and dragged her head over the side of the bed and it bit her violently in the throat. So far, so absolutely classic vampire. Fortunately, she had screamed and alerted her brothers. One brother pursued the creature out of the window and across the lawn. It fled before him through the moonlight with gigantic strides and eventually seemed to disappear over the wall into the churchyard. She seemed like a very rational sort of a person. She said, well, of course, there's an explanation and we must wait for it. It'll turn out that a lunatic has escaped from some asylum and found his way here. So they did what you would do with any trauma victim. They took her to Switzerland. And when she had recovered from that, they brought her home for the winter back to Croglin Grange, where everything continued without event. Then in March, scratch, scratch, scratch upon the window, the same hideous brown shriveled face with glaring eyes. One of the brothers again came in at the screams he was armed this time he fired and hit it in the leg it scrambled into the churchyard and seemed to disappear into a vault which belonged to a family long extinct 
The next day, they very sensibly didn't chase it down that night. The vault was full of coffins. They had been broken open and their contents, horribly mangled and distorted, were scattered all over the floor. It wasn't only the family who were there. There were several villagers, several witnesses too. One coffin alone remained intact. Of that, the lid had been lifted but still lay loose upon the coffin. They raised it and there, brown, withered, shriveled, mummified, but quite entire was the same hideous figure which had looked in at the windows of Croglin Grange with the marks of a recent pistol shot on the leg. They did the only thing that can lay a vampire. They burnt it. Technical point, there are plenty of other ways of dealing with vampires. I do other talks about that if you'd like to subscribe to my channel. But that would take care of it. That, that would be OK. So, I mean, the first thing that occurs to me in relation to this specifically is the V word. It's a very specific word. Um, really, we know about vampires and vampire folklore because of we associate it with Eastern Europe in the early 18th century. And that wasn't because the folkloric creature was invented then. It's because we kind of became, in Western Europe, a bit more aware of it. It was for political reasons, really. Um, the, uh, hung the Austrian Empire, the Austro the Austrians and Hungarians, Hungarians had made inroads in against the Ottoman Empire, and they found themselves presiding over lands um, and people with religious um, traditions that they simply weren't used to. You can see it, the centre of Europe was, and, and actually it's led to political problems right up to the recent day, right up to the recent years. You can see that um, the problems, political problems with the, the Balkans have have originated in these times. Um, and as the Ottoman Empire receded for a very short period, uh, these the Western Europeans came in and said, why are all these peasants desecrating their dead? There were a load of pamphlets, best-selling leaflets and so forth, made their way to book fairs in Western Europe. And it, that then it became popular. Um, it became a popular concept and later on the literature came and uh, was you know it, it took off then vampires are associated really with epidemic death we don't seem as a species to particularly enjoy the idea that we're going to die at all but we're philosophical about it happening when we're 70 or 80 the thing that really sends human beings into a flat spin and where all of the uh, folklore tends to come from is when people die prematurely people come up with concepts that help them to exercise a sense of control over it and Epidemic death is a very big driver in the invention of vampire-like creatures. The other thing is decomposition, is a sort of um, a lack of understanding about the natural ways that bodies decompose. It can happen in several different ways. There could be several different phenomena. And for the very good reason that you don't want to watch your family members rot on your kitchen table, and they're a source of contagion, until these things were quantified uh, by anatomists and published in medical books, people didn't really have an idea that somebody could, under some circumstances, six months after death, still sometimes look pretty good. And vampire folklore is associated with deviant burials, burying people face down, cutting their heads off and putting it between their legs, um, putting a stake not just through their heart, but sometimes through their abdomen to keep them in, uh, in their graves. So this is... Eastern European vampirism and to describe every kind of folkloric revenant, a return from the dead as a vampire is a mistake. It, it's, it's a very, it's a bad use of the term. Um, it's too grand and sweeping. So the fact that we've got something that is referred to as a vampire in the north of England should be something of an alert. The next person to take up the, the story um, was um, uh, Charles Harper in his Haunted Houses. That came out in 1907. And what he pointed out was that it's to be added from personal observations, so he clearly went up there, that there's no place styled Croglin Grange. There are Croglin High Hall and Low Hall. 
Both are farmhouses, very much like one another, and not in any particulars resembling the description given. He did a picture of Croglin Low Hall, and you can see it just looks like a rural farmhouse, quite a nice farmhouse, decent size, but it's two stories. And um, Augustus Hare was talking about a single story building, and that was why the family was sleeping on the ground floor. Croglin Low Hall is probably the house indicated, he continues, but it's, least, it's at least a mile distant from the church, which has been rebuilt. In actual fact, it's as the crow flies, it's probably more like two, perhaps a little over. The churchyard contains no tomb by which any stretch of the imagination could be identified with that described by Mr Hare. And here is the church at Croglin. <coughs> it is a 19th century church. It was done by a pattern. Um, you, could, you can buy plans out of a box. It was an awful lot cheaper than commissioning your own architect. And this one was done with a plan from an architect in Edinburgh, a pattern church. But it doesn't mean that the parish is new. It actually replaced a far older church and the parish is very old. So um, so don't let it fool you. Don't let you think that it's just been there since the 19th century. It's, it's very old. You can see, apart from anything else from the graveyard, that there have been a lot of people buried there. In fact, we have records of the, the uh, incumbents there from a very, very early time. Here they are. Um, I don't know if it's just me being very juvenile, but um, I was incredibly amused to see that one of them was called John de Wetwang. Uh, it's probably locked down, what can I say? And in addition, there is another guy there called George Sanderson, who was the incumbent starting nine, um, 1671. So he, we will be interested in him a bit later. It's worth, have the, it's worth just remembering him. Now, remember that Hare described their house as um, having a terrace which uh, large grounds sweep away towards the church in the hollow and it has a fine distant view. Well, you can see from this aerial version that Croglin Church simply doesn't conform to that description. So are we looking at this church? I mean, it's Croglin Church, it exists what else could there be? Well, if we go back to this map of uh, Saxton's map of um, 1576, you can see up there, kind of in the middle, slightly up and towards the right, that he does label Croglin Church, the church that we've seen, an earlier instance of it. And then if you look a little bit more directly south, you've got um, Croglin Parva. It's a shortening for Croglin Parva. And Parva and Magna um, were quite common uh, ways of, uh, parva basically means small, magna means big. And in communities where you had very diffuse populations, uh, rural communities, agricultural workers, not everybody was densely populated in a town and they could walk 100 yards to the church. What you would get is a parson who would serve a whole area. And the main concentration of the population would be the big town, Croglin Magna. Um, here it's just called Croglin Church, but Croglin Parva, that means it was recognised uh, as a place where religious services happened. It was, it was a smaller part of the uh, uh, of the settlement, but the same settlement nonetheless, even though it was two miles away. And you can see it here on a later Janssen's map of 1646. The same thing, this time we're not speaking in Latin anymore. This is Little Croglin. And there's a little church note mentioned in there. It isn't there anymore, but it is written on this map. Now, the next person to write about Croglin Grange was um, Montague Summers, who um, I think of him as a well-known nutcase. He was a very strange mixture of very old-fashioned and sort of modern. He, he kind of was... Uh, he took Catholicism on as a religion later on, like most religious converts, was probably more zealous than the people who'd just grown up with it. And he also took on the kind of spiritualism and more uh, esoteric sides of religion, the mystical sides of religion that were around at the time. So he's he's ended up being a very sort of religiously strange hybrid. In The Vampire in Europe in 1929, he makes a very valid point 
that um, he he says well he he says that Augustus' hair was undoubtedly lavish in his colouring. So he allows that, but he then comes up with kind of like the big debunking. He points out a publication called Varney the Vampire. Now, Varney the Vampire was set in 1730 at the height of the vampire craze in Europe when all of these um, pamphlets were coming out of Eastern Europe. It's been vaguely, variously attributed to James Malcolm Rymer, Thomas uh, Peckett Prest, People don't really know who wrote it. And frankly, it's not the kind of book you'd want to take credit for. It was published between 1845 and 1847. And in a textbook warning against perverse incentives, uh, Varney's author was paid by the typeset line. Hence, he didn't suffer from brevity. So just to uh, give you an indication, the um, it, it, it's... There was a collected book in 1847. It had 876 double-columned pages, 232 chapters, 667 words. And just by way of comparison, the Bible has got 783. So this is a very long, um, lurid read. It's, uh, it's actually very collectible, that book now. If I, if I had loads of money, I would buy it. Um, and we read excerpts from this. You can see a tall figure is standing on the ledge immediately outside the long window, its fingernails upon the glass. The pattering and clattering of the nails continue, long nails that appear as if the growth of many years had been untouched. She tries to scream again, but a choking sensation comes over her and she cannot. A small pane of glass is broken and the form from without introduces a long gaunt hand which seems utterly destitute of flesh. She drew her breath short and thick. Her bosom heaves. Bear in mind they couldn't... All, all of their sexual content had to, had to be very subliminal in the Victorian era. So um, it, was, it was suggested. And her limbs tremble, yet she cannot withdraw her eyes. Half on the bed and half off it, her long hair streams across the entire width of the bed. The figure seized the long tress, tresses of her hair and twining them round his bony hands, he held her to the bed. With a plunge, he seizes her neck in with his fang-like teeth. So we can already see the parallels that this, the, 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 the assault that was mentioned by Augustus Hare compares really very, very directly to the kind of vampire literature which was absolutely classically, um, you know, there's an example of it here with Varney. Um, Montague Summers does let himself down a little bit because he provides the perfect sceptic foil to Augustus's hair, Augustus Hare's uh, anecdote. But at the last, he, he says, Mr. Charles Harper, in his interesting, if somewhat sceptical study, Haunted Houses, he doesn't think that the criticism of the terrain at all affects the story. He thinks that the vault, which doesn't exist in Croglin Magna Church, um, could have been obliterated. I mean, it could have, I suppose, but you're really grasping at straws there. Uh, such a precaution would be obvious after the fearful experience from the attack of the vampire and would not be a difficult business. So we're taking it for granted that there was a vampire attack. Moreover, it could be done without attracting notice. Um, and it would be wished that the name of the family had been given so that the history of the vampire might be traced. Often such records are destroyed from the domestic archives. So you can see a very typical kind of, um, this is interesting for sceptics here because everything from cryptozoology to anti-vax, all of these kinds of things, it's a kind of an apologia of could have, it could, it could have, well, why can't you prove this? Because this could have happened. You're not really dealing with solid evidence. You're dealing with things that could have happened that would support your point of view. The next person who covered the Crogling Range vampire was um, an actor and writer. His name was Valentine Dial, and he wrote um, a really quite dreadful book called Unsolved Mysteries. Uh, in It was published in 1954. And in that book, he mentioned, he actually named the family. He called them the Cranswell family. And he also placed the story in the 19th century. So we've got the same information from here, but we've got something else. We've got a name, Cranswell. 
The next person, now this man really did add something substantial to the whole thing. His name was um, Francis Fabian Cliveras. He was a publisher and author. And in a periodical called Tomorrow, he um, went up and actually investigated it. He was uh, he was a writer on comparative religion, the occult, things like that. And he went up to Croglin and he spoke to um, a Mrs. Parking, who was a wife of the deceased landowner, and Mrs. Watson, who was a tenant. The story was quite well known locally. So he dug up a lot of stuff that was sort of just oral folklore at the time. Now, they said the vampire attack tenants were called Cranswell. So that was where um, Valentine Dial was getting it from. Um, and she said that Croglin Low Hall was called Croglin Grange right up to the beginning of the 18th century. In fact, local tradition had it um, that at one point Cro Croglin Grange had been single story. It was now two story, uh, but it was remembered or it, it was in the tradition that it had only been one story. And in fact, Cliveros found a corbel in the corner of one of the lower floor rooms and it supported nothing but he reckoned it was stout enough to support a roof so what you would do in those days if you had a substantial substructure um, is that you would just take the lid off the house take the roof off build yourself another floor and put the roof on top of that and it's a stone building they they could have done it um, there was also some Another very, very key point, they pointed out that there was an adjacent church. So we've got a prestigious building, prestigious enough for the parson to have to come down and do services for the family and for whoever worked on their farm, and that it had been demolished during the English Civil War. So here we have Croglin Parver Church. He suggested that the story actually originated from the late 17th century. Mrs. Parkin told Clive Ross that the tale of the vampire attacks are dated from between 1680 and 1690. Now, that was a family called the Towerys who were in there at that time. So um, that meant, and a third family in the village said that the tenant at Croglin Hall had found rat marks on his daughter's throat. So this is yet another victim coming in. But it means that the whole story is sort of active in the local community. Uh, allegedly, he joined in with the destruction of the vampire. So that's another person standing around this uh, hideous coffin with a hideous brown creature in it. Mrs. Watson showed Clive Ross a bricked up window to the left of the front door through which uh, tradition has it that the vampire entered. But at least five windows in the whole building have been blocked. And remember, if you know your English history, that there was a window tax which was um, to raise money starting in 1696 or so. So there were, there were several of them. And it was probably that they had been closed to avoid the window tax. If we look at historic England's record on Croglin Low Hall, it says it's a farmhouse, formerly tower house and hall. So a hall, it was medieval centre of operations for that area. Probably um, 15th century, so 1400s, um, tower and uh, early 16th century hall with early um, 17th century alterations and additions for the late 18th century extensions and alterations and it had been the manor house of the de Croglin, Dacre and Howard families. And then Historic England adds, there was a nearby chapel belonging to the house and it was demolished in the 19th century, best known for its associations with the Croglin vampire. So they're aware of the legend so what we've got so far is we definitely have a chapel. We have another church. We don't need to be looking in the centre of Croglin itself. We've got this smaller um, chapel associated with the manor house, kind of two miles to the southwest. We don't know whether it was destroyed in the 19th century or in the 17th century, but we know it was there. Later on, Lionel and Patricia Th Fanthorpe actually went there, took pictures of it. You can see it's still, it's quite a grand house in its way. It's, it's certainly still big. It's isolated, but it, it's big. And they took pictures of the uh, the inside of the courtyard. Um, and 
I've I've got this picture here from a man named um, Mike Fowler. He went there very recently, was allowed to take pictures, and you can actually see here he took one of the pictures of the bricked up windows. Interestingly, that window has also been covered in um, in horseshoes. And horseshoes are an apotropaic, very common apotropaic measure against evil. You're supposed to keep them up that way to keep the luck in them. More importantly than that, they're made of iron. And iron takes care of all sorts of nasties, um, from fairies to witches to, uh, to vampires. So if you're ever in trouble, then use iron. So the next book was a man named Mark Alexander. He wrote The Haunted Churches and Abbeys of Britain. Now, he, if you, we look back at, uh, at Mark's picture, um, we can see that he's, he had said he had drawn this causal link. He said that was done soon after the vampire attacked Miss Cranswell. So he's drawing a causal link between the idea that there was, that this was done because of the vampire rather than because of the window tax. What he managed to dig up was he went up there again, the same as Clive Ross had done. And there were just a couple of little extra details. He said that there was um, a uh, the daughter of the Reverend Joseph Ireland had been attacked. It was he, he worked this out by a series of letters. There was a letter from the Reverend Dr. Matthew Roberts, who recounted a tale from the Reverend Reginald Green. And the story was my light keeps disappearing, doesn't it? It's probably an omen. Um, the Reverend Joseph Ireland's daughter had been attacked by something that drew blood from her neck. On the third night, her brother set a trap and caught a black bat. They shot it and they followed it to the tomb of George Sanderson. So here we are. We've got this, these various um, kind of little threads coming together uh, together now. We remember George Sanderson, of course, from earlier. He was uh, 1671. Um, and... So he has identified the vampire as Sanderson, and that goes with what Clive Ross was saying about this probably originating from the 1680s, 1690s, uh, further back than the 19th century, in other words. Now, so the problem is he, he identified it as being Croglin Village rather than the Low Hall. Um, the victim is different from uh, Augustus Hare's um, traditional victim, um, and it's dated to an earlier era. So this this is a little different from Augustus Hare's original account, but nonetheless, we can see in here that there are quite a few similarities. Oh, the transformation into the bat. Now, that's a very interesting one. Bats, vampires changing into bats was not really particularly something that happened with Slavic folkloric vampires, the kinds of creatures that were being talked about in pamphlets in the 18th century. They could change into animals. Sometimes they changed into wolves or wolves attacked them. Sometimes you would have to make sure that a maggot didn't escape from um, the, the pyre of a burning vampire because the soul could come out in something alive. But the vampire bat as a big theme really doesn't have much of a place in the folklore. It has a place in the literature. And vampire literature obviously came a great deal after vampire folklore. Dracula in um, 1897 was that he um, he changes into a bat, but it's it's a literary thing. And there are three species of blood sucking bats, but they all come from South and Central America. So the idea that this could be informed by either um, by by nature um, or it, it's kind of we're on dodgy ground there. But something that I do think it's very similar to is a cockatrice. If you've ever uh, read Harry Potter, I'm sure we all have, a cockatrice is a mythological creature. It was ultimately derived from um, classical sources, but it became incredibly popular in 16th century literature, sort of Elizabethan type era. And it's like um, a two-legged dragon, sort of, with a, a curled tail and bat wings and the head of a, um, a, a cockerel. 
And there was a big story about a cockatrice or a basilisk at Regnwick, which is only a few miles from um, from Croglin. The idea is that it came out, I think it was 1733, they also rebuilt their church. So you can see this was a, a common thing that happened. They would have had, um, you know, an Anglo-Saxon or a Norman church would have been falling down in 1733. It was rebuilt, and when they got to the foundations, this cockatrice came out and threatened everybody, and a very brave man named John Tallentire struck it with a branch of rowan, which can be an apotropaic uh, uh, twig. Uh, it can also be very dangerous, so don't trim a rowan bush without asking the fairy or the witch who owns it permission first, otherwise something horrible will happen to you. And the whole village, because of this, became known as Renwick Bats. So... We can see that you don't have to go searching in uh, literature. You don't have to go searching in um, sort of 19th or 20th century uh, explorers journals to find the concept of a bat associated with this. You just have to go a few miles down the road to Renwick. And that's probably where it came from. Richard Whittington Egan in the Contemporary Review in 2005 now, he went and did some serious digging of records. He actually looked and he found out that the Fisher Row family um, were tenants, not the owners. And they were only tenants from 1809 onwards. So the idea that Captain Fisher Row and his family had owned this house for hundreds of years and then outgrown it and then moved to Guildford, we all, we're already catching Augustus Hare out. In fact, um, it originally belonged to uh, the Howard family. Howard, if it's the Howard family I'm thinking of, they were very big land and, um, landowners in the north. Um, and then a family called the Towries in the late 1670s to 1727. They may have still been living in the area. Then a Mr. Johnson, then the Fisher Row family, um, and so what we're looking at here is probably something that was uh, transferred onto the Fisher Row family, but was from a previous legend. Oh, just by way of interest, that means that the Fisher Rows couldn't have had um, a, a vault in the local church because they were parvenus, so they wouldn't have had some medieval crypt of their own. Jeff Holder who is the author of Paranormal Cumbria. Now, he makes a couple of really, really good points. Um, he makes a key point for me, which is that 1870, between 1874 and 1900, many works on Cumbrian folklore and history had been published, and none of them mention the story. With a story that sexy, you would think that it would just keep coming up. And especially there must have been a folklore there, folklorist there every other fortnight going and trying to dig something up. And they didn't come up with this version of it. Good point. He calls the 50s the period of invention. He feels that um, the world was soaked with vampires as entertainment. And it was. There was the literature, there were Hammer horror films, um, there was TV. Um, and so he thinks that all of these kinds of motifs ended up getting put onto this story from modern media. Uh, I think he was probably thinking about the bat in, in that particular case. And he could well be right. Like I said, I think the bat also probably owes something to the cockatrice theme. And he says something very interesting. Are we actually looking at a distorted account of historical religious tensions? There was uh, the 1662 Act of Conformity. If you remember in that century that um, the king had had his head chopped off and the Puritans overtook government for a period of time. Uh, and there was a great deal of upheaval in the, completely the soul of the country, really, in um, people's religious um, life, their day-to-day -day life, a political life. And in the 1662 Act of Conformity, Puritan ministers um, were dismissed in the restored monarchy under Charles II. So uh, they had been, the, the Puritan ministers 
in, in the Commonwealth 1649 to 1660 had been kind of flown in and just imposed on, on communities. They might have liked it, they might have not. And then it was all changed again when the Church of England ministers were put back in. So what he is suggesting, much of the collected traditions point to the origin in the 1680s or 1690s. They do. I wonder if we're looking at a, a distorted view of a 17th century religious dispute. During the Commonwealth, the Puritan regime imposed many ministers on parishes across the country. Such men were known as intruding vicars. And George Sanderson was one such. He actually served somewhere else as an intruding vicar. Uh, he'd started out C of E, became Puritan when it suited him. When the Church of England... Um, uh, when it when the monarchy was restored and it changed back, he again changed his colours, so he became Church of England, so he could keep working, um, and he <coughs> he got the job at Croglin and Kirk Oswald. Uh, he remained as rector of Croglin until his death in 1691. So. The people of Croglin would have two reasons to dislike him potentially. The first is that they might not have liked him supplanting their old vicar. Perhaps they preferred the old vicar. The second thing is nobody really wants to take religious lessons from somebody who simply changes their religious stripes for convenience. He seems to have been an unpopular man. Augustus Hare, remember, the way we started here. He said, for many hundreds of years that um, they, he meant the Fisher Row family, have possessed a very curious old place in Cumberland which bears the weird name Croglin Grange. The great characteristic of this house is that it has never at any period of its long existence had been more than one story high. Well, he's wrong about both of those things. Croglin Grange did exist, but the, uh, the, the name was at least 150, probably more um, years out of date by the time he quoted it. And he gave information that suggested that it had only happened a few years previously. And he also thought it was single story. It wasn't single story at the time, hadn't been single story for quite a while. So this should emphasise to us that we are looking here at an anecdote. It's a very entertaining anecdote, but it is just an anecdote. And all of these writers who've written about Crogley and Grange have dug a bit deeper, and it's been a really valuable thing. So we have a case here of two churches two locations, three potential victims. We've got Hare's original family, whoever they were. We've got the Cranswells, whoever they were. And we've got the farmer with the daughter with the rat bites. Crogling Grange has served us really well. Um, it's a fantastic um, story. It's they, There have been children's stories written about it. And, of course, we have Les Edwards' marvellous artwork to uh, remind us of just how good a story it is as well. But ultimately, it is that. It is just a story. And when you pick out all of the pieces, you can see how it's come together over the centuries to make its own folklore. Thank you. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. That, that, no, was that was really, really fascinating. fascinating. Um, um, can everyone can hear me being repeated? I can hear my own voice. Ah, oh, that's it. Um, yeah, sorry, that, that was really great. What I was going to say is I really love hearing these stories, um, both the stories themselves and their explanations are, are yeah. really fascinating. But it also makes me wonder what kind of stories they'll be telling about us in 100 years time, about <laughs> how weird and wrong we are about stuff. Yes. Yes, there'll um, be stories about sort of Cleo jumping over three houses and, of course, you won't be there to contradict them or to give any context. If they want to say I could jump over three houses, that's absolutely fine by me. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, just next week, then, we've got Jim Cliff. He'll be uh, behind the scenes at the British Board of Film Classification. Ban this sick filth. Um, but now we're going to have a short break. So do hang around for our Q&A. To ask a question or to upvote one that you'd like to hear answered, go to SITP online forward slash ask. And we'll be back at eight o'clock. See you then. Hi everyone, welcome back. I hope you've got your glasses refreshed, refreshed and you're all ready to go with our exciting questions. Um, I've had a question about my um, my wall art here. I just love 
metal, I love metal art. And we've got a picture framing shop down the road from us that does all kinds of uh, arty things, um, paints and that kind of stuff. And I went in there and it was just wrapped up. They'd just taken it for delivery and I just, I just fell in love with it. So it's on my dining room wall. So I'm glad other people like it. Um, so on with the questions. So we've had a few questions about uh, pandemics and vampires. Um, so the first one that comes up is um, Anonymous, who says, I accept the idea of pandemics being scary, but in general, uh, wasn't death not feared in olden times and somewhat ex expected and accepted, especially in childhood? Um I don't, nobody likes it. Uh, I mean, the idea that somehow you could be philosophical about five of your children dying because they did anyway is uh, is definitely not true. There's a lot of evidence that people were very unhappy that people died. But uh, when something is beyond your control, then you must nonetheless have a way of living through it. And so they certainly had to deal with an awful lot more death than we do. They were probably better at coping with it than we are. Um, but the part of their mechanisms for coping with it were probably, uh, first of all, a relationship with God so that there was a point to things so that even if it wasn't obvious to you why half your family should have died, it was obvious to someone and you had to have faith that they still loved you. But more to the point, um, human beings like to, um, th there are accidents from our perception we oversee patterns in the environment, we create narratives, we take it as separate things, we create them, we link them all into one story. And we tend to see agents, we see an intelligent actor. So if something bad is happening, it's actually, strangely enough, more comforting for you to feel that you know what it is, even if it's a vampire, than to have no control whatsoever. Because when you've got a vampire, at least you know you can go dig up all the graves in the graveyards, examine bodies for lack of decomposition and telltale signs of um, life, and then you can do something about it. And funny enough, a lot of the things that they used to do kind of might have helped they had a sense of um they they had a sense of contagion they had a sense of keeping things separate to stop contagion uh, so even where it didn't help in literal terms of stopping death, it did help very much in terms of coping. There was an enemy. And you could focus on it. So you talked about digging up, um, digging up uh, graves, and someone who's obviously heard you speak before about this and wants a, a reminder uh, about the something about the sounds and stuff in mass graves, and how do they fuel vampire myth? Yeah, I'm glad somebody. Am I? Hello. All oh, right. Okay. So this. Okay. We're just yep. adjusting cameras. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, well, I'm glad somebody's gone straight for the gross. Um, basically, decomposing bodies, as I've said, isn't something that we observe. It's not something we're familiar with. But um, if you watched a body decompose, you would realise that they get quite bloated, they get full of gas, and that they pop. Um, sometimes they explode. So... Um, if you've got bodies at different levels, especially during a plague, during a plague you have to make, um, you, you might have to make shallow graves to accommodate a lot of people. Under those circumstances, it won't happen slowly in the colder fractions of the earth. It'll happen closer to the top. You get an awful lot of gaseous kind of uh, buildup and people can pop and explode and so people would go past mass graves and they might think that there was actually perhaps the, the dead were chewing. There were, there were learned treaties written about uh, why the dead chew in their graves. One of the apotropaic measures against uh, vampires in the 16th and 17th centuries were to, um, or to tie corpses' um, head, heads with handkerchiefs so that their jaws couldn't actually um, chew. And if you look in a mass grave, the, the bodies will move just because, you know, you sort of bits will explode. They won't be lying as the way as they, they were before. And because the soft bits go first, intestines and so forth, um, and then bodies move, it can appear that 
um, corpses have actually been eating each other's innards, that they're so hungry that they're eating each other. Uh, so those, it's the noises that are associated with not having a JCB to dig deeply enough, um, having epidemic deaths so that you're having shallow graves, probably no coffins. Coffins are a very recent luxury. People were mostly buried in winding sheets uh, until fairly recently. Um, and the general panic associated with uh, with an epidemic time. You don't want to hear the day the dead whispering um, as you walk past the graveyard when you know that you might be likely to die of cholera or the black death that's absolutely revolting yep. <laughs> really. yep. yeah. and terrifying yeah um have we i mean are there any parts of the world where we've had an increase in vampire stories of vampire attacks because of the current pandemic um if it's happened before well there's a lot of there are indications from um, Eastern European countries that there are some still communities, still still some communities that have vampire belief current. Um, and of course, the difficulty is how would you know? The, we know ourselves from our kinds of funky beliefs, uh, our society's funky beliefs, you know, everything from sort of, I, I don't know, steaming your vagina to um, you name it. People believe in weird shit, whatever. And the thing with vampires is you've got to catch them. So, um, there might there are probably communities in Eastern Europe who are carrying out deviant burials now. Certainly in the 19th century in New England, there was a big rash of deviant burials and people were getting away with it because the graveyards were small and isolated and tended to be close to family houses. So if you don't have to go with a digger into the local church, then that helps things to remain private. Um, with this latest pandemic, I don't know how that has had any effect, but all I can say is that people who are without agency um, tend to do all sorts of strange things all the time. So I don't see why our era should be any different. And, and the deviant burials are what you were referring to before, the heads chopped off and... Yeah, perhaps people burnt to ashes, although that takes an awful lot of fuel and it's quite conspicuous. Um, but you can, uh, what they were doing in New England in the late 1800s was they were taking hearts out, just burning the hearts and then feeding the ashes to the people who were next in line to die, the people who were usually suffering from tuberculosis. Um, so there's all kinds of weird things that you can do to vampire corpses. Some are more conspicuous than others. And becoming more revolting by the minute. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Paul Picticule asks, given the overt religious content of many vampire stories, how much of vampirology is taken on board by Christianity? Well, that's interesting that you should mention that because obviously um, the phenomenon of belief in vampires had to be taken account of. That doesn't mean to say you have to believe in it, but uh, first of all, you had the Orthodox Church, which didn't particularly approve of it. But pe but it, it would be a mistake to think of religion as being one pure thing that your priest tells you to do. Most people, especially kind of 50 years or 100 years more and more sort of into, the, into history, didn't have... A very pure idea of um, separating their belief into authorised and unauthorised. They, they know what they get in trouble from the priest for doing. Uh, but if you've got um, a saint with stigmata and you've got somebody who's died and is coming back and sucking blood, they're both very mystical concepts. And so the idea that you could draw a line between them and separate them so completely is... Um, that isn't the way people experience their spirituality and their religiosity. It's a very theological approach. So if you've got this top-down approach, then obviously you've got pastors saying that, no, this is wrong. Generally, the Orthodox Church kind of integrated it um, a little better. Um, they, you, this, the, the vampire, the real vampire legend, it comes from pre-Christian Slavic traditions. Uh, Slavic religions uh, but the Orthodox Church kind of integrated it in various ways um, the 
Muslim overlords of the Ottoman Empire couldn't give a monkey, so you just had to pay a tax for not being uh, Muslim. So you kind of you did what you wanted. Um, the Catholic Church was shocked and appalled at the desecration of um, of corpses. Protestants would think that anything that was out of order, because the Age of Miracles was gone, was uh, the devil deceiving you. So everybody has a kind of a theological angle depending on their background. But the, for the people who were actually doing this, they were just dealing with the physics of their existence. You know, uh, everybody starts dying of tuberculosis, you look for your head vampire. Yeah. So Nadia, who I think is our Nadia in Russia, uh, it asks, why did those scary and disgusting Eastern European uh, Vodalaks get so sexy in Victorian England? Was it a way to vent the suppressed sexuality? I think it probably was, yes. I mean, there was, um, that's quite perceptive. There was a, uh, on, on the part of Nadia, you sexuality was really repressed in Victorian times and if you wanted to discuss it in literature it really had to be sublimated into another what in, into another meal that had to be sort of I don't know you know domination and it, it, it actually sex became quite sadomasochistic and um, if you got somebody who followed the early vampire stories from the sort of romantic re revival in the beginning of the 19th century then they'd be able to give you a blow-by-blow -blow account of how this happened. Um, so, yes, vampires, folkloric vampires, were randy, but they weren't attractive. Uh, so an, another disgusting thing that happens in the grave is with everything else being bloated in the body, penises can become bloated too. So um, what you can get is when you dig up your vampire, it looks like he's pleased to see you. So the idea is that um, vampires were interested in sex, but of course you wouldn't want to have sex with one. This also gets confused with, uh, with sleep paralysis. Vampires, first of all, attack their own families. That's understandable if you think about it being epidemic death, because if you're going to have a microbe in a family, it's going to start carting off you know the members after you know the people who after they died and then if you've got so if you've got this this vampire attack stroke tuberculosis um attack happening within a family and then you've got the wife of the family is sleeping on her back she's been sleeping badly and she gets an attack of sleep paralysis <clears throat> then that can be um unpleasant um predatory it can also be very sexual so that so vampires do have a reputation for being randy um, folkloric vampires but not attractive yeah so so given that it's um randy but revolting uh, and yeah. a question from anonymous who says uh, what is it about vampires that makes them so attractive i mean there are tv shows about sexy vampires what the fuck? yes i know i know and really they've never gone out of fashion since they started to become popular in literature and i think it's because they are they're very flexible um, as a motif. You know, you can have a tortured, misunderstood soul, like uh, Interview with a Vampire, somebody who, who's who been through the ringer, who um, is immortal and, and sad. Uh, you can have somebody who is just um, a hedonist. You can have somebody who's dominant. You can have... Uh, it just lends itself to so many things. And also, I would say, because my... The other half of my life has been in working in creature effects. That if you're going to make a horror movie, then making a vampire movie is a great deal cheaper than making a werewolf movie because fur effects are very labor intensive and expensive. So um, vampires are, tend to be solitary creatures, unlike zombies. If you make a zombie movie, you've got to make you've got to make up a horde of people. If you make a werewolf movie, you've got to have an expensive fursuit. If you're going to make a vampire movie, there's one guy with some funky teeth and uh, one silicon makeup. Yeah, I rewatched um, American Werewolf in London last oh. week. I, it was given the era, the effects were amazing. The, the transformation, I thought, was wonderful. It was absolutely seminal. It still stands up. It was um, Rick Baker, who's an absolutely classic guy uh and there was the there was the armatures that, as his face grew out and everything like that weren't there and they had as he went across the floor they actually had him on a, a dolly as kind of a skateboard thing so that he could move in a very smooth way um 
while his limbs were articulating. And yeah, it's it, it was a classic thing. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Rick Baker. Um, I will wither with shame if it wasn't. Um, Dave, sorry about that uh, digression. Um, Dave the drummer asks, British vampires seem to be quite mundane in contrast to the romanticism of proper vampires from Transylvania. Do we have any cool vampires? No. Next question. <laughs> Leathery skin and yellow eyes, it seems to be. Yeah, no, um, I, Dave, you're quite right. We have... Really, we have revenants. Um, there are, we have various medieval accounts of people that have come back from the dead. Um, Walter Mapp writes about one. Um, William of Newborough writes about a couple of them. And they're people who come back from the dead and can cause death or misery or whatever. Uh, but they're usually a sign of something having uh, something cosmically having gone wrong in the world. And more than one point, person has pointed out that William of Newburgh, for example, was writing in the time of what was later called the Anarchy. It was the Civil War in England when um, Empress Matilda and King Stephen were fighting it out for who was going to be the monarch. And quite a lot of aristocratic spats don't trouble the the peasantry, but this one did. It was an unpleasant time in history. And and so it's been read that the, the stories of the revenants coming back, there was one Funny enough, up north as well, um, somewhere near the borders, uh, it, it came out of its grave and it spread pestilence. So again, we've got the theme of epidemic death. And the idea is that he was expressing the kind of the, the unease at the fact that the, con the country was politically in turmoil. Things weren't as they should be. Um, put another one from Paul, Pick to Kill who asks, belief in conspiracy theories and pseudoscience seem to have increased massively in recent years. Is the same true for the belief in vampires? Um, I don't know. I, I, I doubt it because vampires are uh, incredible, literally. And I think you probably have to be um, I think you probably have to be undereducated and mm -hmm. suffering a very precarious life somewhere a bit backward to actually still believe in vampires. Um, I, I mean, obviously, you're, you're right to point out that those other beliefs are like beliefs in vampires because they're not they're they're people who lack um, the intellectual tools or don't use the intellectual tools to sort out the way the world really is instead of the way that they would like it to be. Um, or if they have the intellectual tools, they use it to convince themselves that they were right in the first place. Yes, yeah, quite possibly, quite possibly. I, th I think if you're looking, I, I think probably there's an awful lot of vampire um, fetishization. I think that's probably got bigger and bigger and bigger over the years, and I don't see how that would go away, given it's so strong in entertainment. Actual belief in vampires, um, you are more likely these days, I imagine, to believe in homeopathy if you've got an internet connection and you go around l looking for Deepak Chopra videos. Um, but to actually believe in vampires, I imagine you would still be uh, a bit technologically behind the times. I don't know. There's someone, someone's PhD thesis in that. Mm. So, um, Skeptical Gumby from Oxford asks, why aren't vampires supposed to like garlic? Is it because people can smell them coming? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, the garlic was used, garlic has been used as an apotropaic against all sorts of horrible creatures. And in general, asfetida as well, very uh, sort of a related um, plant. The idea is that you repel nasty things with things that are even nastier things that are even stronger there are um records of people sort of stuffing stuffing mouths with garlic and that kind of thing uh so it's and also interestingly garlic really is actually an antiseptic i mean it's not as good as dettol but they didn't have dettol so uh so silver actually um people still use silver in wounds you probably know that cleo yeah you just reminded me i'd forgotten yeah <laughs> So, so there are some of these traditional things you can see that actually they're they're kind of a bit useful, not in a particularly technological way. We have better things, um, but uh, yeah, garlic is is used against all sorts of um, disgusting things all over the world. All over the world, it's not just not just here. No, no. Right, that's interesting. 
Well, in, you think about it really also, it's just strong smells in general as yeah. thought to bring on good things, repel bad things. What what else is incense in church? Yeah. Smells nice to garlic. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Anonymous asks, how were vampires viewed by the learned men of the time in the 17th century, etc.? I mean, the closest thing to a scientist or a natural philosopher, what, what did they think about vampires? Well, that depends on your angle. And you, it's a good question because people really did uh, produce learned, treati- learned treaties on these things. There was a guy called um, uh, Leo Alatius was his um, his Latinized uh, name or uh, Leone Alacci was his Greek name. He was, I think he was born Orthodox but became Catholic and so his whole shtick was kind of... He, he was more or less trying to logic everything into um, uh, into a Catholic worldview. Um, and also, vampire belief was really, really prevalent in Greece. There was a phrase there, uh, oh, yes, you might as well. It, it was. It's like take, taking coals to Newcastle is taking vampires to Santorini. Um, Santorini, or the Greek word thera, is supposed to be an absolute center of vampires so he was dealing with that folklore and people were just assimilating it into their own theological worldviews um there was uh, a michael ramft um wrote uh, masticatione mortuorum you know why why corpses chew in the grave uh and there were so there were a lot of catholic scholars usually catholic scholars because they were encountering it for the first time in western europe and they were trying to make sense of why people believed things and they were trying to do it in terms of their own theology which included things like um basically you, you know demons have god's permission to operate in the world um, and that kind of you know, yeah so you're, you're right there were, it depends on your angle it depends who you were but there were lots of learned treaties that took this very seriously no thanks the next question is from andy wilson of incredulous fame and he says thanks for the talk nice to see you again Hi, are, there any, are there any examples you could share of current vampire stories happening now legends in the making um, I think you would probably have to look. There was a there was a brilliant book I I got. Um, what is it? Uh, I lose track of them. I have a few. Um, oh, here we go. This was this was a good book uh, about vampire stories in Poland, and the, it goes all the way back. But it comes up to kind of the twentieth century too, I think. Um, so. You know that they, when they're part of the lingua franca, they tend to get assimilated into stories. Um, I guess time will tell, but I would, for, for I was going to say authentic vampire stories. They're all authentic if someone believes them, I suppose. I tend to differentiate between folkloric vampire phenomena and literary vampire phenomena. But, of course, these days, if someone was experiencing a vampire, they would use their own software, and their own software is 21st century. And so that would probably include literary allusions. It would probably include um, changing into a bat like Dracula did. Um, It would probably include, you know, all sorts of things that we get from classic films. So... So it will be interesting to tell as time goes on if people start to have these experiences, what they will integrate into them. I mean, I do. I wrote a book for. I, I wrote a um, chapter for a book a little while ago on the phenomenon of the Hull Werewolf. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that. It's a kind of a cryptozoological event that happened in Hull a few years ago, and. Uh, there's a lot of background to this. You know, you, you see you see in the newspaper oh, somebody saw a werewolf and you're like, yeah, give him a you know, so, so give him another bottle of gin, I'm sure he'll recover. But it's but a lot of people saw this and made the story out of it. So if people are making werewolf stories, um preposterously in Hull in the twenty first century, then they're probably making vampire stories somewhere too. And we'll find out what they look like when they come out. That's really interesting. So the next question comes from Andrew, and it's about towns and stories. He says, is this a usual an, a usual amount of attention for a vampire's tale in a small community to get, the, the Croglin Grange one? Or is this the folkloric equivalent of going viral? Why this one? 
Oh, that's interesting. This wouldn't, it's a good point because the mechanism of the story matters every bit as much as uh, the particulars of the story itself. And I think we know with this one that it went viral because of Augustus Hare. For all that he was incredibly inaccurate over details and for all that he didn't check anything and that he was just in effect reproducing an an anecdote, he was um, the thing that got the story out into the wider world. And we've seen from the evidence that there was a lot of backstory going back centuries, including different families and including different motifs, uh, but um, that it, it transformed, it, it sort of condensed into that perfect little story in Augustus Hare's book. So, again, still thinking about these towns that have these stories, uh, Gray the Earthling asks, when a village has folklore like this, does it prompt research into the place's real history? And has folklore led directly to genuine discoveries? I I hope it would. Of course, there must be so many of these stories that have just been lost over the years. Um, We started getting radio and television in the 20th century and, you you know, local accents disappeared, for for example. Joyce Grenfell did a, a great piece where she was talking about somewhere in... I don't know, it was Kent or Essex or something. And she was doing a full kind of like Somerset accent. And that was that was the accent of a rural person there, probably only as recently as Edwardian times, where our, our culture has become so much more um, homogenised because of ra- radio and TV. It's probably splitting off a lot now because of the internet and because we can choose our own channels a lot more. Um, I mean, there's there's us all talking this evening and you can go off and, you, you know, you've got your own curated Twitter feed and your own curated and um, Instagram feed. So perhaps uh, all the little sort of peculiarities are, are going to spring back up again. But um, I feel that the people who, especially the people who started in a really good evidence-based way, like Clive Ross, he went up there, he spoke to people, um, he went through records, uh, Whittington Egan went through records and, and found, he they picked the bones out of the story. And uh, so they, they kind of, they found out something about that community, something that would otherwise have been lost. If it had just been that, oh, well, nobody really liked George Sanderson in the late 1600s, did they? Um, that that story would have had no life. It's because it's got momentum because it, of these themes that have changed over time, but they've made it live for longer. So they people those those people in the 20th century who went and found all of this were doing a kind of archaeology um and coming back up to date again igor who's also in russia um it's very exciting isn't it having people all over the world yes fantastic Uh, have vampires in russia too yeah um he asks uh, if vampire stories are made of superstition fears and repressed desires and the, the repressed desires of the time what do you think modern time analogues would be? Right. So, yeah, basically ways of coping with epidemic death um, or ways of, I mean, you know, I, I think I, I think um, alt-med comes close because there are people who feel like they can, you know, realign their chakras or whatever they do. Uh, so what you're looking for is you're looking for generally for something that is an agent, something that is deliberate and which is actually these lights keep going i don't know if you can see that but it just it looks weird um and uh so you're looking for an agent and i suppose perhaps we have a bit of that with anti-vax stuff people thinking that there are evil people trying to um install uh chips in their arms and things like that um but also just simply ways of making sure that the problem is simple that it's solvable and that it's controllable Right, and that's what vampires did, I suppose. That's what. That's how yeah. people. That yeah, it's how pe- they served people's psychology. So Claire next asks, um, when was the first ever account of a vampire? Um, she said she's heard a rumor that it all stems from people buried alive who came back from the dead, so to speak. So probably accidentally buried alive. Anything in that? Uh, it depends what you count as a vampire. There have been 
people who have sort of very tortuously uh, said that vampires were first sighted on, you know, Babylonian cylinder seals because somebody was trying to stake a corpse or something like that. Um, but if we are strict with our definitions and we talk about proper vampires from Eastern Europe, from Slavic areas, uh, they're a religious construct, uh, they're a way of dealing with epidemic death and they're associated with deviant burials, then they... Uh, um, they probably started before Christianization in those areas, and they probably are a vestige of uh, of pre-Christian religion. There's there's a curse in is it a Slavic or a Greek curse. It's 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 a curse. May the ground not receive you. The idea was that the ground was your mother, and that it was a blessed thing to go back uh, when you died it was kind of like you were going back into the womb. So it wasn't a sort of a penance. It wasn't a horrible thing. It was like, you know, return to the mother. So if you were spat out by the grave and you had an eternal kind of a life, then that was seen as a curse. Um, so uh, what was the question again? I'm going off on one. What are the earliest vampires? The, yeah, the very first. Yeah, if, if there was a first. Yeah, if there was a first. Very so clear. the first vampires that we know about come with a couple of things first of all they come with written records and second of all they come with an alien population coming in and looking at people and going what are you doing that for because people don't feel the need to write great long reports about the bleeding obvious there are strange things that we do every day that somebody coming in from 500 years in the future or even from the past would go, what on earth do you think you're doing? Sometimes it takes an outside observer. It doesn't mean that the tradition is invented then. It means that it is simply recorded then. Um, uh, Pukowski. This is a, a really good book. It's called The Darkling, A Treatise on Slavic Vampirism. And he is Jan Pukowski. And he's very good at tracing how the vampire came to be. Uh, in its location um, and points out that, you know, the vampire and uh, werewolf mythology are kind of quite closely linked. So um, he, he would have it as sort of around, I think he, he reckons around ninth century or so that it started to uh, actually crystallize. But revenants, the idea that you, c you have people coming back from the dead, that's kind of everywhere. Uh, uh, they're not, Strictly, they're not vampires as we would recognise them, but uh, people come back from the dead for all sorts of reasons. That the death is thought to be a bit of a permeable membrane to a lot of people. Um, another question from Nadia, who says, "When was iron replaced by silver as a patent and anti-vampire repellent?" <laughs> I have a feeling that that was probably a literary thing because it was. Did um, I don't know much about vampire literature to be honest, but didn't Quincy have a silver bullet? Did he? I don't. I don't know. In in Dracula, uh, certainly. Yeah. I, yes. Was if he, I think there were there were silver bullets in Dracula. I think. Yeah. I'm. I'm not. I'm not sure, but it, it kind of sounds familiar. Certainly, silver bullets became associated with werewolves later. Um, iron. A silver wasn't particularly available to peasants, so it would be very strange if it had worked its way deeply into any folklore, really. Uh, but iron was available to peasants. Yeah. Fairies and didn't like iron either, did they? Who didn't? What didn't? Fairies and evil fairies. Uh, no, yeah, you can repel fairies with iron too. Um, and that's, I find that interesting because iron was a massive technological leap when it occurred. It occurred at different places at different times and people still continued to use old metals, of course, because they were still useful. Um, but the thing about iron was that you needed a very intense heat source. So you need to burn coal or peat or something like that. And you need bellows so that you can intensify the temperature. And it was a very skilled thing to work. So you developed a class of specialists and so it, 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 the advent of iron really represents a sort of a technological and, um, you know, also quasi mystical uh, time in, in so the societies when it happened. It would have been expensive. You would have only have had the posh people using iron to begin with. Um, so, so iron was iron was expensive. It was new. It was potent. 
and you can see how it would have been thought of as a kind of the, you know the, the the super material of its day um, anonymous asks about a question about the fisher family he said what do you think of the hypothesis that the fisher family did not actually have any family tradition about this until Hare's 1901 book came out oh you think that um, augustus Hare might have just Sort of, I think he's suggesting, or she's suggesting, he invented the whole thing. He could have, I suppose. That would suggest, though, that he knew something else. That he, he knew it from another source. And given what we know, that um, Augustus's Augustus Hare's details are so abysmally off on so much of this stuff, uh, then it doesn't seem that he did original research of his own and then transplanted it onto someone else. He probably just was sitting there half pissed for an evening, um, remembering every other detail from Captain Fisher Row. Um, another question going back to the, the maps that you showed at Croglin Grange. It said it has a pe remnants of a peel. Um, they say a peel is a fortified house construction. Yeah. Does that feature in the story? What, what is a peel house? It doesn't, but it's interesting. It makes it's interesting about the terrain. A peel tower is a tower where uh, you could, when you had Scottish raiders coming over the uh, over the border, um, that you would quickly get your sheep and your livestock in the bottom uh, layer, and then you could live on the top layer, and hopefully uh, they wouldn't be able to starve you out and they wouldn't be able to shoot you or anything like that. So there were fortified towers. There are remains of them all over the north in Cumbria, Northumberland. Um, and there is a Peel Tower, which has now been changed into a house opposite uh, Croglin Magna Church. Mm. So, yes, there there is a Peel Tower. There's also on one of those maps, they notice, they note what looks like a stone circle. And it's in the wrong place, but I wonder if they're referring to Long Meg and her daughters, which is a Cumbrian stone circle. It's well worth visiting because unlike Stonehenge, I think you can still get to it, but it's also very isolated. So it isn't surrounded with um, tourists and ice cream vans. I mean, you can go there and you can have it to yourself. Um, and it's like I say, it's marked in the wrong place on the map which is odd because they were good cartographers, but I've, I've a feeling they, they were drawing a picture of Long Meg and her daughters. Right. Um, the next question is going to, I'm going to have to say what's been in my head for the last at least 15 minutes with this next question. Because um, <laughs> the question is, why were vampires always men uh, when there were plenty of images of women as evil and corrupting? And what has been in my head is Spike. And suddenly Drusilla has jumped in. Oh, yes. Uh, Oh so, yeah, but I'm, I'm I'm distracting from the question. I just had to get Spike and now Drusella out of my head. But were they always men? No, no, they were equally men and women. Um, in fact, uh, there were there was an old woman, was an old woman called Melitza, who was um, always lean and spare in life, but was plump in death. So she had grown on the blood of people as she uh, was sucking their blood after death. So no, no, absolutely not. No. Um, the two of the most famous vampire cases we have happen to be men, but no, women suffer from um, being vampirized too. And they're quite good at drinking blood when they're dead. Yes. 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 Um, so somebody asks you, so a question about your uh, bookshelf. How many skulls do you have on your shelf and whose are they? Ah, right. <laughs> uh, these are people who ask the wrong questions. Um Oh, here we go. Well, this this one, this one's nice. Uh, this is a small wolf skull. Uh, Can you lift this up just a little bit higher? That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, he he's very nice, but he would have been tiny. Um, and this one is uh, this one is a gorilla. And the interesting thing about that is you can see the attachments that this this line up here in the skull is where the muscles attach. They go down through the jaw and then they they go to the lower jaw. So if you've got a great big fat... If you could just up a little, little bit higher again. There you Thank go. You. Brilliant. So if you've got this great big fat line here, that means you have got enormous mass of muscles. So you can see how easily, how well uh, gorillas can chew and, and chomp down on things. They need to... Um, to go through, you know, like the equivalent of bamboo or something. So you can see why they need to chew all day. They, they don't eat bamboo, but, you know, similar kind of things from wherever they come from. Um, 
what else have I got? I've got um, it's just a human skull. That's boring. Um, it depends yeah. whose it is. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and there's a there's a, a bigger wolf one on the way as well. On the way. Yeah. Um, and uh, coming on to last question, um, sadly, is do you have a favourite vampire? And if so, who? Yeah, I do. I do. There are two cases in the literature which kind of, because they were, um, they came out in best-selling leaflets and they're so well attested. So anyone who really likes vampires will refer to Arnold Powell and uh, Peter Plajogovich. Um, but you it's not Peter Plajogovich, it's Petr Blagojevich, but it was just an anglicisation of it. Uh, Arnold Powell fell off a wagon and broke his neck in uh, 1732, 31, something like that. Um, but my favourite is Petr Blagojevich because I went to visit his grave. It's hard to find. I know where it is. I went there. And I'm going to make a video about it one day. I do have the footage. I just haven't had time to cut it together. Um, I went over to Belgrade to work and uh, I got a driver and ju just took the driver out, went for a day. Carl and I went to um, the graveyard where this guy is buried. And you can still see it in Cyrillic writing. If you could read the Cyrillic writing, you can still see the Blagojevich um, surname. Why is he so wonderful? He he's just one of the classic cases, um, and he it's one of the well attested cases. Uh, basically, he was thought to be a vampire. There was the, the normal thing: lots of deaths in the village. They dug up the uh, the various corpses to see whose fault it was, and when they got to his, it wasn't decomposed to a satisfactory level, and. The people there knew exactly what to do. There was there was no problem. But at that point, um, they had a superior from the Austrian um, authorities. His name was uh, Ernst Frombold. And he was an, an imperial provisor. He was there. He was the authority. And he said, no, you can't, you can't do this. Uh, we, we must send to Belgrade a few days away for uh, for some information. And the local priest wasn't very keen either. He was there as well. And he said, no, no, you shouldn't do this. But the locals were so scared of what the vampire Blagojevich would do within those few days that they said, I don't care who you work for, we're doing this. So he reluctantly, Frombold and the local priest, reluctantly were witnesses to a van vampire exhumation. And um, I think he was uh, he was burnt on a pyre. Um, so I it's... Uh, you wouldn't no. want a vampire hanging around while people just went off to uh, consult no. you. No, I, you know, I would like half your village to die of tuberculosis while I complete my paperwork. <laughs> yes. uh, was in effect what they were saying. So, uh, so just because we have such, um, uh, you know, a good account of it, and because I found him, I didn't find him because the grave would be too old. Well, actually, he wouldn't have a grave. They they burnt him and shoved him in the river. Uh, but I went to the river. I went to the graveyard, um, and I I know where he was, and I know where it happened. And that that physical sensation of kind of having touched something um, was amazing. You know, you when I a pilgrimage, I, that, that was a pilgrimage. It was a pilgrimage, and and this is the thing: is that even, even, you know, we skeptics, and we know about uh, people getting a sense of contagion from touching things. You know, you don't really become holy because you touch the Pope's skirt, and but nonetheless, it still makes a difference if you've got an idea in your head. And I read about him years ago, uh, and then I went there, so it was very special to me. Brilliant. OK, well, thank you very much indeed. And uh, we're going to have to wrap up now. So can I say thank you very much to David and Malcolm, who's be, who've been our broadcast text tonight, and to Dave, who's been my backup, and he's been managing the Slido questions. So if you want to carry on the chat, we're opening our pub, the Lockins Razor, on Zoom. So you can join us, as I've said before, you can join us with or without your video and audio. So if you'd rather just observe till you feel more comfortable, that's fine. You can drop in and out of our breakout rooms without needing to announce yourselves. So there's to have, 
there's time now just for one final round of thanks for Deborah, her excellent talk before we meet again either next week for the banning of sick filth or tonight in the virtual pub. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye.